questions. Okay, thanks very much, Kelly. Let's just thank Kelly one more time for that story. Thank you. And now we're going to move to another iconic species, the platypus. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sue Martin, who's with us in the room. Sue is an environmental educator and she's the chair of Cat Eye Hills Environment Network, known as Chen. And I'm also going to introduce at the same time Michelle Ryan, who is somewhere in there. And she is an aquatic ecologist and lecturer at Western Sydney Union, has worked a lot with Chen on eDNA for finding platypus. So here we go. Thank you for inviting us to talk about our Cat Eye Hills Environment Network platypus project. I'm actually just the backup in case Michelle didn't appear on the screen. <laughs> but there she is, so that's wonderful. I um, we've just got a PowerPoint. Alicia, are you going to put it up? And I'm just going to do the first two slides and then sit down and, and hand it over to Michelle. Um, and I do actually want to acknowledge, I'm in a very esteemed room and acknowledge Julia over there who just won the New South Wales Environmental Educator of the Year Award for her government role. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Cat Eye Hills Environment Network started in 2016, so we are a very new organisation, but we are based on the, the Cat Eye Catchment Management Committee, so we are actually a very old committee, so it's, you know, we've been, we, we are a group of amazing local people wanting to look after um, Cat Eye which is part of the Hawkesbury Nepean. So we are um, there in the Hawkesbury Nepean. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we're on Darug. Our, our land is Darug that we connect to and look after and um, work with. Next slide. And just want to share a little bit. There's the map of Cat Eye that we um, have grown from um, the wonderful help from Zuela and acknowledge that. And um, we, uh, uh, I want to show you the little environment centre there in Annagrove. So we do work closely with the hills and um, what are they called now? The Hills Shire Council um, and, and acknowledge that. Um, Catherine Clare there is our land care support officer with um, Danielle Packer, who's our Cat Eye Aware project officer. And just acknowledge that um, Jacqueline Britton was our Cat Eye Aware project officer who's recently um, moved on. But this platypus project has been through the work of um, Jacqueline and, and Michelle will share a little bit more about that. But, um, Danielle today is off doing bird watching in Fred Caddison, so can't be here. So it, it is a really lovely group doing beautiful things. Um, next slide. But we are very new. And we do, um, just sharing for all of the anecdote from when the Cat Eye Catchment Management Committee was around was that there are platypus in our waterways. So we came, we started in 2016 thinking, well, what would we do? And platypus was one of the, the main things. But when we went out to um, council, uh, government, it was, well, it's not, on, it's not on the wildlife register. It's not there. If it's, not, if it's not on a register, we can't acknowledge it. So for us as Chen, it was finding ways to um, get that platypus study happening. And Michelle was critical in that. And I do actually want to acknowledge that it was from the federal government's community environment program giving us a little bit of money that actually got this um, project underway. And I hope it blossoms. So I will now pass on to Michelle and, um, 
Over to you, Michelle. Thank you. So did you want um, to continue with the PowerPoint on your end? Or did you want me to bring it up here? Can you bring it, can you bring it up? Yeah, yeah. Okay, hopefully that's showing for you all now. Got your desktop, Michelle. Awesome. <laughs> I really like this technology and being able to do things from home, but sometimes, is it better now? Yes, it's good. Excellent. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Zoom's funny and sometimes doesn't show us what it's showing you. Um, so we worked with Cat Eye Hills Environment Network and they have a really great um, number of volunteers and community members who are really passionate about identifying platypus. We had a number of fishermen and landholders who had contacted Cat Eye Hills Environment Network and who had told us about the platypus in the area. So we were able to locate a number of what we call platypus hotspots in that Cat Eye Hills district to help us do some sampling. And traditionally, to catch platypus, you would set nets. You would watch them overnight. Platypus are air breathers, uh, so they can... Um, drown in discarded nets. So when you're sampling for platypus, it's really labor intensive. You have to make sure you're on the ground the whole time the nets are out, constantly checking nets. Um, and it can take quite a few nights to catch a platypus in a waterway. But a new technology has evolved where you can take a simple water sample and that water sample can look at the DNA profile of the water and look at what species are present. So it's a really great way of looking at what's in water systems. And they can tell hundreds of species now through this water analysis. So we just wanted to look at one species. We chose to just look at the platypus. And we had over a weekend in June, we had a series of volunteers go out and collect these water samples. Um, this second photo here, is really how easy it is to take the sample. So you've just got to push water uh, through a small filter and that captures the DNA in the water. You store it on ice and you send it off to the lab for analysis. Uh, it's a little bit of an expensive process, um, but as Sue said, we were lucky to receive a small grant from the federal government to do this in Cat Eye Hills. Um, we also uh, did a volunteer assessment sheet. So we looked at things like um, bask, uh, burrowing habitat, um, vegetation type in the riparian zones, things like that, um, to do an assessment of the habitat. We also looked at pH, dissolved oxygen and temperature, because they're really easy for the volunteers to take uh, using some of the equipment we had at the university. So we went through 18 sites in the Can I Catchment um, and had a look at where platypus were and weren't. Uh, and it was, we were really excited. We had eight out of those 18 sites had at least one sample um, positive for platypus eDNA, which was really exciting. We weren't expecting that. We <laughs> were expecting one or two. Um, we really had no idea how many were out there, but it looks like uh, you know, we have quite a few in that cat eye catchment. We were quite surprised where we got positive samples. Um, these are the sites, some of the sites where we got them. And you can see they're kind of, some are a bit urbanized. Think of like the back of the Box Hill, the Gables development, um, kind of after that is some of these sites. Uh, some quite high turbidity, as you can see in this bottom corner here. This site, uh, we knew those platypus there, well, we knew the platypus had lived there um, the landholder in the floods in February had found a collapsed burrow. Um, so we were hoping that there was still platypus at that site. 
um, but that's uh, in Little Cat Eye Creek and it's quite turbid, uh, skinny, um, lots and lots of invasive weeds surrounding it. So we're quite surprised we were finding these, the platypus really close up to those more urban areas and um, really not, we didn't find any in these beautiful, um, more rural areas in like Kenthurst, Maruda. We thought we would find some in the areas where people don't go and that they would be undisturbed some beautiful native vegetation surrounding it, quite deep pools for them, um, really good water quality. So we were quite surprised that at these um, sites we didn't find platypus. We also found that um, the volunteers doing the assessment, we found that the sites where, that were positive for platypus had better dissolved oxygen. Uh, and we believe, and we're going to go look at this further, that that um, is because of the water bugs at that site. So there's probably a better diversity abundance um, of water bugs at those sites with higher dissolved oxygen, which is why we're getting platypus there. Platypus um, don't need dissolved oxygen and water. They're air breathers, but we think it influences their food. Um, and pH, there was a little bit of a difference, but it wasn't a significant difference. What really surprised us, and I've alluded to it already, is that the sites where we found platypus scored lower in habitat assessment than the sites where we didn't find platypus. And that was really surprising to us. So we're gonna be investigating this further as to why we're getting platypus in these more urbanized areas of the catchment um, than the more uh, remote areas. Uh, you might have seen we got a lot of publicity for this. We, the purpose of this study was to determine if there was platypus or not. And we really wanted people to start acknowledging that we have a platypus population in the Sydney Basin, that these platypus populations need to be acknowledged and they need to be protected, especially when they're so close to urban development and urban growth areas. Uh, so we did... Uh, with Caddo Hills Environment Network and the uni. We did a bit of a media campaign. We had our first live breakfast radio interview with Wendy Harmer and Robbie Buck, um, which was great. And we had a really good response to it. We've been approached by a lot of people, a lot of councils, uh, and we're currently working with Sydney Water to develop a partnership to look at um, platypus kind of in their uh, discharge areas. Kadai Creek receives discharge from two sewage treatment plants. And we think that this discharge is helping maintain the water levels in those areas of the creek that allow the platypus to stay there. It's giving them habitat, it's providing water for them, where in times of drought, the creek might run dry. So we're kind of working with that, um, looking at that with Sydney Water. Uh, we're going to be going in summer and looking at macroinvertebrates, so looking at the water bugs. So this little glass shrimp on the side here is one of the favourite foods of the platypus. Uh, so we're going to be going and having a look at those sites with platypus, those sites without platypus, and having a look at the difference in the macroinvertebrates. And in March, hopefully March next year, we're hoping to secure some more funding uh, to do a wider survey. Uh, in the Cat Eye Basin and a bit further abroad, hopefully in Hawkesbury, um, in Penrith and down a bit south, uh, to have a look at where we have more platypus in the Sydney Basin. We um, are really excited by the fact that we found platypus. Um, so we want to know where else they are. And along with all of this, uh, Cat Eye Hills Environment Network are uh, advocating for the platypus, are advocating for waterway health in the hills area um, and they're raising awareness, they're doing education um, and that's going to continue and grow throughout the next few years. I just wanted to kind of end a little bit, I'm not sure if you want me to show this on my end or your end. Um, once we got in the media a little bit, we had a number of other people contact us 
about spots and we were lucky enough to receive this video from October last year from a fisherman at Cat Eye Creek um, with the platypus and he's quite surprised he sees it. You have to watch the video. I'm gonna, we'll replay it about three times. It's kind of in the middle of the screen to the right. You see it for about two seconds before it pops down. Um, but I'll play it on my end and let me know if it mucks up for you. Put it, we'll put it on from our end. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I hope you saw that, that was a platypus. Oh my gosh, I hope you saw that, that was a platypus. So that was a very excited fisherman. He had just brought his GoPro, he said, and he was just had it on him the whole day while he was fishing. So he was very excited uh, to catch that. And we were really excited to see that, even though it was only a second or two of platypus. So thank you, everyone. And are there any questions? Thank you, Michelle. And wonderful that we got to see a platypus. And I can see your hand and I'm going to come over we've got a couple of minutes hi julie overton um michelle are you planning on doing any studies in the upper georges river catchment yeah absolutely i actually have a phd student who is going to be looking at that catchment um we were up in berrima the other week having a look at that but she's going to come a bit closer as well so yeah we are uh, that is going to be her area and she'll start sampling probably spring next year um, but there are quite a few platypus reported there, um, which is really exciting. If that's your area, I'd love to get in contact with you and speak great. <laughs> yeah, um, and essentially uh, it's, it's great um, having community members work with us because they know the area and they know it um, really well. So that would be awesome, thank you. Can you tell us how much the tests actually cost? Yeah, sure. So it's about $120 per sample and we run, uh, it's always good to run three samples per site. So um, while it's not cost prohibitive, it is quite a lot when you're looking at, you know, 20 sites and then three replicates at each site. Uh, it gets quite expensive. But it's really simple and easy to do. Um, and it is something that I think you could crowdsource, uh, crowdfund, especially with people in your area. Um, and it's really good to have volunteers uh, collect it. So in terms of, um, you really just need to pay for the DNA analysis, uh, the commercial lab. And we'll take just one last question from the Zoom. Can I, I'm just gonna ask one from one of our Zoom attendees, Lisa Harold from Mulgoa Landcare. Lisa is asking, can you also look at Mulgoa Creek and Jerry's Creek? And also, what are the impacts of carp? Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. I uh, would love to do some in your area. Uh, there's currently a platypus floating around the Nepean River at Emu Plains. Uh, lady keeps seeing it most mornings when she's kayaking, so that's exciting. Um, in, carp have a really huge impact on water quality, as you all know, um, but the main things that carp impact with platypus is the removal of vegetation, which removes the habitat for macroinvertebrates, so the food of carp. So they really impact on that food web, um, reducing the amount of available food for um, platypus. They also impact on burrowing habitat, increasing erosion of the banks. Uh, so carp have a really huge impact on platypus 
uh, and we really should be working to remove carp in any habitat we think where our um, platypus are. I'll be in touch with you, Lisa, when... Um, just a quick one for you. Thanks for the presentation, Wale. Um, why do you think the good quality pools uh, were lacking in the platypus that you discussed earlier? Would it be connectivity or any other reason? Yeah, we're really not sure. And that's what we're going to go explore over summer. We're starting in December uh, to look at habitat assessments. Um, we really do think it's due to food sources. So um, for whatever reason, the diversity of macroinvertebrates might be different. Um, and we might be missing some of those key species that the platypus like, um, but it is definitely something we're going to be exploring uh, and we will hopefully have an answer to that by March or April um, when we do more eDNA and this macroinvertebrate and habitat assessment. Okay, thank you very much, Sue and Michelle. And if you've got any